All right, welcome to the first video on biology. And today we're gonna to take a look at eukaryotic cells. Now, this is a super important topic for the IMAT. It shows up in almost every test, so you really wanna be able to know this stuff. Now, a lot of students, when they study eukaryotic cells, will be content with just learning maybe one or two sentences about each organelle and then thinking that that'll be okay. For the IMAT, that is not gonna cut it. This is what an IMAT style question could look like. So take a look at this. A skin cell was being studied in the laboratory. Which of the following biological molecules could one find in the cell's nucleus? Okay, so it's a question about the nucleus. They've given us here the biological molecules and you have to know what you could actually find inside the nucleus. So as you can see, you need quite a detailed understanding of this organelle if you're gonna be able to solve the question. First of all, you need to know that the nucleus contains DNA and it contains linear DNA, not circular DNA. So number two is correct and number three is false. You also need to know that the DNA is contained in something called chromatin. And part of chromatin is something we call histones and histones are proteins. So number one is true. And you also need to know that transcription occurs in the nucleus and transcription is when we turn DNA into RNA. So number four is true. And that means that option D is correct. And here's the annoying thing about the IMAT. You have to know all these things. If you forget just one of them, well, then you'll get the question incorrect and you will lose marks. You'll get that negative 0.4 mark. And obviously that's not something you want. So you need a detailed understanding of eukaryotic cells if you're gonna be able to answer these types of questions. But don't worry, that is what this video is for. We are gonna go over every component of a eukaryotic cell in such detail that no matter how tricky they make the question, you will be able to get the answer correct. But before we can actually deep dive and dissect a eukaryotic cell, we should look at the differences between prokaryotes and eukaryotes. That's very helpful in understanding what a eukaryote actually is, and it's also a good skill to know for the IMAT, because the IMAT can ask you questions about how prokaryotes and eukaryotes differ. So let's take a look at the differences first. Most obviously is probably that eukaryotes have organelles and prokaryotes, they don't have organelles. Eukaryotes, they divide by a process called mitosis or meiosis, depending on what type of eukaryotic cell it is. Prokaryotes, they also divide, but they do it by a binary fission. Eukaryotes have both linear and circular DNA. Now the linear DNA is found in the nucleus, but the circular DNA is actually found in other organelles like the mitochondria or the chloroplast. Prokaryotes, they only have circular DNA. Eukaryotic and prokaryotic cells also differ in their average size. The typical eukaryote will be between one and 100 micrometers. And some of them are a bit larger than this, but we'll cover all this when we actually look at cell size. So what about the prokaryotes? Well, they're between 0.2 and two micrometers. You don't need to remember these exact numbers. We'll actually look at this in more detail when we consider cell size, but just understand that eukaryotes are typically bigger than prokaryotes. Having said that though, the largest prokaryote is bigger than the smallest eukaryote. Moving on, eukaryotes have what we call chromatin that arranges their DNA. And that chromatin is organized by proteins called histones. Now prokaryotes also need to pack their DNA, but they do it via nucleoid proteins. Eukaryotes also have something called the sodium potassium pump. Prokaryotes, they don't have this. They only have the proton pump. Now, when it comes to actually generating energy for the cell, eukaryotes have two processes that prokaryotes don't, and that is the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain. Prokaryotes, they don't have this. But prokaryotes have something that eukaryotes don't have, and that is a capsule. At least some prokaryotes do. Okay, now maybe you're looking at this and you don't fully understand what all these things mean. That's fine. I'm just putting this down in a list so that you have a complete list of differences. We'll cover these things in more detail in future videos. For now, I just wanna make sure that your list of differences is complete. Now that was the differences. Let's look at the similarities between prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Now, both eukaryotes and prokaryotes have ribosomes, but eukaryotes have two types. They've got the ATS and the 70S. The ATS is found in the cytosol, and the 70S is found in mitochondria and chloroplasts. Prokaryotes, on the other hand, they only have the 70S ribosome. Now, all cells need a cytoplasm, so that's something both will have. All cells need to separate themselves from their external environment, so both will have a plasma membrane. And of course, all living things need DNA and RNA, so that is also something they share. Some eukaryotic cells, like sperm cells for instance, will have a flagella, and a lot of prokaryotes will also have flagella. 
A flagella is basically a whip-like appendage which allows the actual cell to move. Now, both need a cytoskeleton, and we'll look more into what a cytoskeleton does in future videos. Certain types of eukaryotic cells will also have a cell wall. Plants, for instance, will have a cell wall, and this one will be made from cellulose. And on top of that, fungi will have a cell wall, but this will be made from chitin. Now, prokaryotes will also have cell walls, but in this case, it'll be made from peptidoglycan. And finally, both eukaryotes and prokaryotes need to make energy, and part of that energy process for eukaryotes will be the glycolysis process. For prokaryotes, this is the only way that they actually make energy, though. But both of them share glycolysis, so I'm putting that to the list. Alright, now if you don't understand what all these things mean, that is completely fine. We will look at it in more detail later. But for now, I just want you to have a complete list of similarities and differences. Now that we've covered that, we are almost ready to start actually dissecting a eukaryotic cell. But there is one important thing we have to know about first, and that is what counts as a eukaryotic cell. Now, maybe you're rolling your eyes at this and thinking you know what a eukaryotic cell is, but trust me, it is important to be 100% sure, because the IMAT can ask you tricky questions. For instance, an IMAT question could ask you something about, for instance, a yeast cell, or an amoeba, or a bacillus, or something like this, and you just have to know in your head, is this a eukaryote or not? Because if you don't know whether it's a eukaryote or not, you won't know about all those differences. You won't know if they have those organelles, or if they have 70S ribosomes or 80S ribosomes, and so on. Now, there are four types of eukaryotic kingdoms, and the first one is the easiest to identify, that is the animals. So if you're dealing with a mammal cell, or a crustacean cell, or a jellyfish cell, or anything like that, well, then you know it's going to be a eukaryotic cell. Then we have the plants, and these are things like mosses, trees, ferns, all these types of things. So if you're dealing with cells from any of these organisms, well, those are going to be eukaryotes as well. Now, generally, people don't have any problem identifying animals and plants as eukaryotes, but they run into some confusion when it comes to fungi. Things like mushrooms and molds, people generally, they can identify those as eukaryotes, but they run into some confusion when it comes to yeasts, because yeasts are microscopic, and they think, well, if they're microscopic, maybe they are actually prokaryotes. But no, yeasts are eukaryotic. So a yeast cell does have organelles, it does have all those other things that eukaryotes have, so don't get confused. And then finally we have protists, and this also tends to trip up a few people, because protists are unicellular, so people think they might be prokaryotes. But no, they are eukaryotes. And examples of protists include things like amoebas, slime molds, and algae. Alright, so make sure you can identify the following cells as eukaryotic cells. And assuming you can do that, we can now move on to actually dissecting a eukaryotic cell. And generally in the IMAT, the most important thing is focusing on the organelles. So what is it we want to learn about them? Well, first of all, we actually want to know what the role and function of the organelle or cell component is. I mean, cells don't have these organelles or components for fun. No, they actually perform something for the cell. So we want to know what that is. And very important for the eye match, you want to know the composition and the contents of that component or organelle. Now, the IMAT loves asking questions about this. They'll, for instance, give you an organelle like the endoplasmic reticulum or the nucleus, and they'll ask you, what can you find in here? Can you find protein? Can you find nucleic acids? That kind of stuff. And I'm going to cover all the contents of the organelles in the remainder of this video and in some future videos. At least, I'll cover everything that's important for the IMAT. I might not go over absolutely everything, but if I miss something, it's because it's not something you need to know about for the IMAT. I don't want to overload you with information that's not necessary, so if you think I've skipped something, it's because it's not important. Alright, then we also want to know what type of activities goes on in the actual organelle. Now, these activities could be things like transcription, or translation, or DNA replication. We want to know if these activities actually occur in the organelle, because the IMAC can also ask questions regarding this. And then finally, we also want to know any specifics about the organelle. So if there's like a niche property regarding the organelle, we want to know about that. Now we can finally begin dissecting a eukaryotic cell, and I'm going to cover these four things for all the organelles and all the cellular components that are relevant for the IMAT. So let's get into that now. Okay, here we have a hypothetical animal cell. 
And what I mean by hypothetical is that it's not an actual cell that exists. You know, it's not a cheek cell or a sperm cell or anything like that. No, it's just a hypothetical animal cell that has a bunch of components and organelles that we want to learn a bit about. Now for the remainder of this video, and then in later videos as well, we're actually going to go into these organelles and other components and actually explain everything you need to know about them for the IMAT. But for now, don't worry about that. For now, we just need to be able to identify them. So first of all, here we have a mitochondria, and you should always be able to identify them because they have this iconic shape. And what is the main role of the mitochondria? Well, that is ATP production. It's the energy source of the cell. Then we have a lysosome here, which, I mean, you wouldn't be able to know just by looking at it since it's just a circle. I mean, these could have been the lysosomes if I defined them as such. But for now, just assume that these are lysosomes and these have digestive functions. Then over here, we have some vesicles and these vesicles are basically just carrying some cargo. Maybe it's proteins or maybe it's lipids, maybe it's something else, but they are being released from the cell via exocytosis. Okay, then we've got this big thing here, and that's the nucleus. Now, as you can see here, the nucleus actually has two membrane layers. And these membrane layers aren't continuous with each other. There's actually gaps in between them, which form what we call the nuclear pores. Then inside the nucleus, we've got the DNA, which is this line here, which we call chromatin. And in the center, we have something called the nucleolus. Attached to the nucleus, we then have the endoplasmic reticulum specifically the rough endoplasmic reticulum. And the endoplasmic reticulum is often abbreviated ER, and then you designate the rough endoplasmic reticulum as the rough ER or the RER. Following from the rough endoplasmic reticulum, we have the smooth endoplasmic reticulum or SER. And the only difference between these two is that the rough ER has ribosomes on it. You can see these dots here. Now, ribosomes don't only exist on the rough ER, they can also be found on the nucleus here, since the nucleus is continuous with the rough ER, but they can also be found out here in the cytosol. And they're exactly the same thing, it's just that these ribosomes happen to be in the cytosol, and these ones happen to be bound to the ER or nucleus. And that's why we call them bound ribosomes, and these cytosolic ones we call free ribosomes. Okay, then we have some more membrane sacs over here called the Golgi apparatus. And we'll explain what that does in a minute, so I won't go into that now. You can see here as well, we have another lysosome, and here we have a vacuole. And yes, even animal cells have vacuoles, it's just that they're a lot smaller than the ones in plant cells. And they also have a different function. Over here we have two peroxisomes. Here we have a flagella. And here we have some cilia. Over here we have something called a centriole. And if you have two of them stacked up together, you will get something called a centrosome. Out here we've just got some outside material and it's being taken into the cell, either via endocytosis or phagocytosis. These squiggly lines here, what are they? Well, both of these two are part of the cytoskeleton, and in a moment we'll explore what that does. Then of course there's the actual boundary between the outside world and the cell, that's called the plasma membrane. And then we have the cytosol, where everything is actually suspended in. Okay, so I don't expect you to take notes or anything at the moment. For now, just make sure that you understand where everything is in the cell. Now, we're going to go into a lot of detail for all these different components. So it's important that you don't get lost, that you always remember that all this is inside a single cell. Okay, it's also important that you realize that cells don't actually look like this. I've only drawn it like so because it makes it easier to actually learn from. But a real cell won't just have one mitochondria. There will be hundreds or thousands of them. So keep that in mind. Okay, now let's actually go into an organelle and study it thoroughly. And the first one we'll look at is the nucleus. Okay, here I've drawn a nucleus and this nucleus should be attached to the rough endoplasmic reticulum, but since we're only studying the nucleus for now, I've left that out. Okay, so as you can see here, the nucleus actually has two bilayers. One, two, that's very important. These two bilayers aren't always continuous with each other either. They're separated by these nuclear pores here, which allow for things to come in and out of the actual nucleus. As you can see here, here we have proteins coming into the nucleus, and here we have mRNA and tRNA leaving, and we also have some ribosomes leaving. Here we have a dense part of the nucleus, we call that the nucleolus, 
And then throughout the nucleus here, we have this shading here, which is chromatin. And we've got this dark chromatin and this light chromatin. And I'll explain what that is in just a minute. Okay, so you can see here I've broken the nucleus up into various subcomponents. And remember those four things that we wanted to know about each organelle or each component. We want to know what the function is. We want to know what it contains or what it's made of. We also want to know any activities performed. And if there's anything niche or anything unique about the organelle or component, we want to know that as well. So let's start here with the nuclear envelope. That's this double membrane thing that covers the nucleus and separates it from the rest of the cytoplasm. Okay, and you can see that I've grouped the nuclear envelope into two components. First of all, there's the bilayer component. That's basically just this phospholipid bilayer, and there's two of them. And then also the nuclear pores here, which are these areas here. We'll start with the bilayer. Now, whenever you think of a membrane, which is what the bilayer is, you should always think of phospholipids. So we'll write that down here. Phospholipids, that's what it contains. And remember, phospholipids are lipids. That's in the name, so I won't write that down. But always think of in terms of what type of actual molecule we're dealing with. Okay, what else is the bilayer made of? Or what else does it contain? Well, you can sort of see here these orange dots. These are meant to represent ribosomes. Remember, the actual bilayer is attached to the rough endoplasmic reticulum. And the rough ER has ribosomes on it. So you can also find ribosomes. Now, what are ribosomes made of? Well, maybe you know, maybe you don't, but I'm just going to tell you what they're made of. They're made from rRNA and proteins. So we'll include that as well, because the iMac can word the question quite differently depending on what they're asking. And all I mean by that is if the iMac did ask you a question relating to the content of the nuclear envelope, they could either ask you if the nuclear envelope contained ribosomes or if it contained rRNA and proteins. Both are correct because ribosomes are made from rRNA and proteins. So you have to think in these terms. For the IMAT, it is a very important skill to be able to translate things in your head. For instance, a ribosome, you should know that that's rRNA and protein. Or you could word it differently. You could say it's nucleic acids and proteins because rRNA is a nucleic acid and stuff like that. You, you get what I mean. Okay, that covers the actual nuclear envelope's bilayer portion, that is this bit here. Let's move on to the nuclear envelope's pore, which we call the nuclear pore. First of all, what's the role of the nuclear pore? Well, it allows for selective permeability. That is, some things can come out, others cannot. Some things can come in, others cannot. Okay, so what's the pore made of? It can't just be a big gap because then anything could come in and anything could come out. No, the nuclear pore is actually made of proteins and that's pretty much all you need to know at the IMAT level. Okay, now you also need to know what can come in and what can come out. What do you imagine could come into the nucleus? Well, I've already drawn it up here. These are proteins coming in. And why would we need proteins inside the nucleus? Well, for one, one of the roles of this thing here, the nucleolus, is to make ribosomes. And to make ribosomes, you need rRNA, which is actually made inside the nucleus, but you also need proteins, which is made outside the nucleus. So coming in to the nucleus, or coming in through the nuclear pores, is proteins. And really, that's the most important thing to know. I can also mention that ions can come in, but really, that's not too important to know. I'll just add it in for safe measure. Okay, what about what comes out? Well, remember how I said that ribosomes are made in the nucleolus? Well, we want ribosomes outside the nucleus. We don't want them in the nucleus, so ribosomes must come out. So we'll put that here. Out ribosomes. Now, remember what ribosomes are made of. They're made of rRNA and protein. So rRNA and protein also leaves the nuclear pore. But I won't write that from now on. From now on, I just want you to know that ribosomes are made from rRNA and protein. So wherever ribosomes go, think of them as rRNA and protein also going that way. Okay, what else leaves the nucleus? Well, hopefully you know this from your prior studies of biology, but inside the nucleus, we have the majority of the cell's DNA. And what is DNA used for? Well, it's transcribed into RNA, and that RNA is actually used outside the nucleus, inside the cytoplasm. So RNA has to leave. Okay, what type of RNA specifically? Well, 
The RNA that leaves directly is the mRNA and also the tRNA. But remember how I said the ribosomes leave, so really it's rRNA as well. So we'll put all of them here, M, T, and rRNA. And since I mentioned ions can come in, I may as well mention that ions can come out as well, but again, that's not too essential to remember. Okay, we've covered the nuclear pore section and the bilayer section of the nuclear envelope. I think we can now move on to the nucleolus, which is this dark portion here of the nucleus. Okay, what is the function of the nucleolus? Well, for the IMAT, you just need to know that it makes ribosomes, specifically the ATS ribosome. Not the 70S, that's made somewhere else. So AT, A, ATS ribosome synthesis. That is the role. Okay, what does the nucleolus contain? Well, for one, it contains DNA. Really, everything inside the nucleus contains DNA. Now, since it's involved in making ribosomes, obviously it also has to contain protein and rRNA. For the IMAT, that's as deep as you need to go. Maybe an expert in biology would tell me that I'm missing something, but remember, we're not gonna go into every detail here. This is for the IMAT level, so I'm gonna leave it at this. Okay, so we've covered the actual nuclear envelope and we've covered the nucleolus. So what about the rest of the stuff, this shaded stuff here inside the nucleus? Well, that's what we call chromatin. Now, chromatin is just the DNA of the cell, or the DNA that's inside the nucleus at least, wrapped up around those histone proteins that I mentioned before. So let's write that here for what it actually contains. DNA and histones. And histones are proteins, so I'll put that in brackets here. That is what chromatin is made of. And remember, chromatin is this stuff here and this stuff here. Now, technically you can find RNA in here as well, but Chromatin itself is not made of RNA, so I'm not gonna put RNA here. But if, for instance, the IMAT gave you a picture of this nucleus and then gave an arrow pointing to this region and asked you, what can you find here? You could find RNA there because it's being transcribed. So keep that in mind. Okay, you might also notice that the chromatin here is in different shading. This one's really dark and this one's really light. What's going on here? Well, there's two types of chromatin that you need to be aware of. There's heterochromatin, which is this dark one here, and there's euchromatin, this light one. What's the difference? Well, heterochromatin is really tightly packed DNA, or tightly packed chromatin. And because it's so tightly packed, it can't be transcribed. That is, it can't actually be turned to RNA, and that RNA then can't get turned into protein. So we say that these genes here are not expressed, or they're not expressible since they're in heterochromatin form. The euchromatin is loosely packed though, so it can be transcribed and then turned into protein. So we say that the genes here, they are expressible or they are transcribable at the moment. And this can obviously change, but for the moment, we're just gonna assume that it's static. And what you'll find is that the heterochromatin tends to group here at the periphery. Now you can see that they don't cover the pores and that's so things can actually come out because remember the heterochromatin is really tightly packed. So if you covered it here in the pores, it would block things from coming in and out. We don't want that. But it does tend to group here around the periphery, whilst the euchromatin tends to focus around here in the center. Okay, let's write that down. So we'll put here heterochromatin, and that is the non-transcribable version of chromatin. Non-transcribable. Then we have the euchromatin. And remember, that's the loosely packed one. So this is the chromatin that is transcribable. And remember, heterochromatin and euchromatin, it's still chromatin. It's still made of DNA and histones. And I'll put here as well, because I didn't mention that before, but it is important to keep track of, that the DNA is actually linear. Remember how I said we had both circular and linear DNA? Well, all the DNA in the nucleus is linear DNA. That pretty much covers all the components of the nucleus. Now let's look again holistically at the nucleus. That is, we're gonna look at the whole organelle as one unit. What actually does this whole organelle do? What activities does it perform? Well, Remember that the nucleus contains the DNA of the actual cell, or most of the DNA of the eukaryotic cell. 
Now, if the nucleus has so much DNA, then surely that DNA must be replicated. So we can say here that DNA replication occurs in the nucleus. For the IMAT, you can remember the following. Wherever you find DNA, you will also find the DNA replication activity. Why? Well, because cells divide, and if they're going to divide, they need to replicate their DNA wherever it is. So wherever you find DNA, you will find DNA replication. Now, hopefully you've already studied DNA replication in your high school studies. If not, don't worry, we have a video on that later on. So if you don't know what DNA replication is, then just put this to your notes for now and it will make sense later. But I have to include it now, even if you don't understand it, and even if I haven't described what it is, because we are talking about these components of the eukaryotic cell and I need to list everything that goes on and everything that is making up these various components. Okay, what else goes on in the nucleus? Well, wherever you have DNA, you have to have transcription going on as well. Why? Well, because DNA has to be used for something. It's not just sitting there doing nothing. And we can't directly use DNA for protein synthesis. We have to use RNA for that. So wherever you find DNA, you will also find transcription. Okay, what else goes on in the nucleus? Well, we talked about how the nucleolus makes ribosomes. So we can say that the nucleus is involved in ribosome synthesis because the nucleolus is part of the nucleus. So we'll put that here, ribosome synthesis. Anything else? Well, really these are the activities that are performed in the nucleus, but I will just add one more thing as well. And that is that the nucleus itself replicates during mitosis and meiosis. Now, this is something we'll get into later, but I will put it to your notes anyway. Okay, that pretty much covers everything you need to know about the nucleus for the IMAT. Let's summarize everything we just learned about the nucleus. And we'll start by looking at what types of activities can occur in the nucleus. So what were they again? Well, remember here is the DNA. Well, that means that we have to have DNA replication. Now where there's DNA, there's also gonna be RNA, so there has to be transcription. And remember the role of the nucleolus, that was to make ribosomes. So one of the roles of the nucleus as a whole is to make ribosomes. And as a side note, we also mentioned that the entire nucleus itself replicates during mitosis or meiosis. Okay, that's the activities of the nucleus. Now let's go into the various components and what they are made of. So we'll start with the nucleolus and what was that made of again? Well, remember it's made of protein and rRNA because it makes the ribosomes, and DNA as well. What was its role? Well, it makes ribosomes, specifically the ATS ribosome. That's all we need to know for the nucleolus. Let's move on to the nuclear envelope. What can we say about that? Well, first of all, it contains phospholipids and it contains proteins. Remember, the phospholipids was the actual bilayer, or the two bilayers, I should say, and the protein refers to the nuclear pores. What is the role of the nuclear envelope? Well, it's basically just to separate the nucleus itself from the rest of the cell, that is the cytoplasm. Okay, what about the nuclear pores? What can we say about them? Well, they're made out of protein. That's the important thing to know here. And their role is the passage of certain molecules. That's what we refer to as selective permeability. Now, do you remember what they let in and out? Well, in comes proteins, because these proteins are required to make the actual ribosomes, and there's no protein synthesis going on in the nucleus. So these proteins actually have to be imported. And I also put ions there. That's not too important to remember, but I put it here anyway. Okay, what about what goes out of the nucleus? That is, what exits the nuclear pore? Well, remember those ribosomes that are made in the nucleolus? Well, they're no use inside the nucleus, so they have to leave. And since ribosomes are made of rRNA and protein, we can say that rRNA and protein leaves the actual nucleus. And on top of that, the DNA that is transcribed will form RNA, specifically mRNA and tRNA. And that'll leave the nucleus as well. And again, I put ions. Now we just need to mention the chromatin as well. So remember the chromatin is the actual DNA packaged together by histones, which are the proteins. So, Chromatin contains DNA and proteins, specifically histones. There's euchromatin, remember that's the loosely packed chromatin, and that is the one that is transcribable. It is also the one we find at the center of the nucleus, 
And then we have heterochromatin, and that's non-transcribable because it's densely packed. That's the one we find at the periphery. What is the role of chromatin? Well, it basically packages DNA. Now, I didn't mention this before, but we actually have around two meters of DNA in our nucleus. And as you can imagine, that much DNA needs to be packaged properly. So that's what chromatin is for. And it's also used for gene regulation. Remember how I said that the heterochromatin can't be expressed, but the euchromatin can? Well, this is a way for the cell to actually avoid certain genes being turned into protein and allow other genes to be turned into protein. And obviously, when I say turned into protein, I don't mean the genes themselves are turning into proteins. I mean they're being transcribed, and then that'll form protein. Okay, that covers the nucleus. So if you can remember all this, you should be fine for any type of nucleus question that the IMAT gives you.